Good afternoon. This is the two minute warning. Please press one to ask a question. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's update on COVID-19. As of today, we have had 849,630 confirmed cases in North Carolina, 3,346 cases reported since yesterday, 1,530 people in the hospital, and sadly, 11,074 people who have died. This week, our nation passed the tragic milestone of 500,000 lives lost to COVID-19. We continue to mourn those in North Carolina, across the country, and the world who have died. But despite these grim statistics, we have reason for hope in North Carolina. Fewer people are getting sick. Fewer are needing a hospital. All the metrics that we measure continue to stabilize. More people are receiving life-saving vaccines every day, and in fact, more than half of the people 65 and over in North Carolina have been vaccinated. And we're working to make sure that race and ethnicity vaccination rates reflect our population and that we are reaching underserved communities. And today marks the first day that our educators are eligible to get vaccinated. Teachers and school staff will be able to get their shots as providers continue to vaccinate those in groups one and two, that is people age 65 and up, and our frontline health care workers. On March 10th, additional members of Group 3 essential workers will be eligible. I know that many people, including me, are eagerly awaiting their turn, and the state will continue to work hard to get more vaccine here from the federal government. More students are able to return to the classroom in person following our recommendation on February the 2nd that in-person learning can happen safely when proper health protocols are followed. 
Getting children in the classroom is critical for their education and overall health. School districts across the state know this. And within the next few weeks, schools serving 96% of our public school students will offer in-person instruction. Even with children returning to schools all over the state, I have told legislators that I would sign a bill like Senate Bill 37 that they just passed requiring children to be in the classroom as long as they fixed it to require schools to follow the Department of Health and Human Services guidance and to preserve emergency authority for state and local officials. Now, an important update on our COVID-19 metrics. After alarmingly high numbers throughout the winter holidays, North Carolina's trends have declined and stabilized. Hospitalizations have dropped to their lowest point since before Thanksgiving. The percent of tests returning positive continues to decline. This is encouraging, and I'll ask Dr. Mandy Cohen, our Secretary of Health and Human Services, to talk more about our COVID-19 metrics. I'll then walk through what these developments mean for the COVID-19 protocols currently in place and the executive order that's set to expire in just a few days. Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Governor. As Governor Cooper said, we have used data throughout our pandemic response to guide our actions. It's guided the dimmer switch approach we've taken and informed how we've deployed our resources to this response effort. North Carolinians can be proud that our state continues to be recognized for its data quality and transparency. This past week, Bloomberg News scored North Carolina as the best in the nation on vaccine race and ethnicity data quality. It's highlighting that our reporting of race and ethnicity data is nearly 100% for people vaccinated in the state. Okay, let's get to our data for today. This first graph looks at people who come to the emergency department with COVID-like symptoms. This is our earliest detection mechanism. And you can see, when looking at that yellow line, it continues to trend downward. Next, we look at our new cases. This first graph shows you the trajectory of new cases each day since we had our first case back in March. And looking at the yellow line, you can see that the cases are decreasing since its peak in January. New case rates are back down to the levels they were in October. This next graph narrows in on that trajectory of cases over just the last two months. And you can see that cases have been declining since their peak on January the 10th. Next, we look at the percent of tests that are positive. This graph goes back to the end of December. And looking again at that yellow line, our percent of positive tests is continuing to decrease and is at about 6 to 7 percent, closer to that 5 percent goal. On our next graph, we look at day-over-day -day hospitalizations. This graph also starts in late December. And you can see, looking at the yellow line, that this trend is decreasing. Hospitalizations are now back to where they were in mid-November. Now, they're still high, but significantly better than they were just a month ago. Okay, so overall, here is where we are. Our surveillance data is decreasing, but still above baseline, it gets a yellow line. North Carolina's trajectory of cases is decreasing. However, cases remain elevated, and with those new COVID variants in the state, we need to keep our guard up. It gets a yellow line. North Carolina's trajectory in percent of tests returning positive is decreasing, but still above 5%, so this also gets a yellow line. And North Carolina's trajectory of hospitalizations is decreasing, but still elevated, it gets a yellow line. Now, let's look at what's happening in our counties. As a reminder, the COVID-19 County Alert System uses a combination of three metrics to categorize counties. We use cases per 100,000 people over 14 days, percent of tests that are positive, and a composite hospital impact score. We then use those metrics to combine them together and categorize counties into three colored tiers to describe their level of viral spread and healthcare capacity impact. Red is critical amount of spread, orange substantial, yellow is significant. Now this slide shows an updated county alert map. Again, we see good progress. 
27 counties are red with critical spread, but that's down from 61 counties that were red just two weeks ago. 40 counties are orange with substantial spread and 33 counties are yellow. Looking at the past county alert maps, you can see that the bottom map shows the fewest red counties in the state since the start of our county alert system. However, we still have more than half of our counties in either the red or the orange. So while we're improving since our peak in January, we still have more work to do. With North Carolinians continuing to follow the three W's and more than one million people in the state having received at least a first dose of vaccine, we are slowing the spread and saving lives. At the same time, we face a new challenge. Those new COVID-19 variants are a wild card. We know these variants are here in our state and are more contagious. So keep wearing a mask, waiting six feet apart and washing your hands. We've seen in the past how fragile progress can be. So we need to keep protecting each other while we get everyone a spot to get their shot. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Given the significant and sustained improvement in our COVID-19 metrics, today I'm announcing that we will ease but not lift restrictions in several areas with the new executive order that will go into effect this Friday, February the 26th. The only restriction we will lift is the modified stay-at-home order. That means no more curfew starting Friday and more opportunities to gather, shop, and attend events if done safely. When it comes to easing some restrictions, we're depending on people to be responsible. The mandatory mask mandate will not change. As more people gather together, it will be more important than ever to social distance. These proven safety protocols are vital as this virus is still here and infecting people every day. So here are the main changes. Many businesses and venues will be able to stay at or expand to 50% occupancy while still maintaining health and safety protocols. For example, gyms, museums, aquariums, barbers, other personal care, pools, outdoor amusement parks, retail establishments, restaurants, breweries, and wineries may now open at 50% capacity with health and safety protocols. The time for on-site service of alcohol, uh, for the time for ending that service, will be moved to 11 p.m. Additionally, some businesses that were limited to operating outdoors at 30% will still have that percentage, but will no longer have a 100-person cap. That includes outdoor sports fields and venues, stadiums, outdoor bars, outdoor amusement parks, and other outdoor businesses. The new order will also allow some indoor businesses to open at 30% capacity with a cap of 250 people. These businesses include bars and taverns, indoor amusement parks, movie theaters, indoor sports arenas, and others an exception for larger indoor arenas with a capacity of more than 5,000 people will allow up to 15% of their capacity if additional safety protocols are followed. And that means that most college and professional indoor sports like basketball and hockey can have fans at 15% capacity with certain conditions. It's also important to note here that bars and taverns will be allowed to open indoors for the first time since near the beginning of the pandemic. Capacity indoors is 30 uh, percent. Other safety protocols will be imposed and official, officials will enforce this, these limits. Like restaurants and other venues, alcohol sales must stop at 11 p.m. Finally, in other circumstances not outlined above, the mass gathering limit will be increased to 25 indoors and 50 outdoors. We know that this virus still spreads in social visits and informal gatherings. Easing these restrictions will only work 
if we keep protecting ourselves and others from this deadly virus. The order and our own common sense say that health and safety protocols must remain in place. We know that new, more contagious strains of the virus are here in North Carolina, as Dr. Cohen said, and carelessness could lead to a backslide. We're making progress. In addition to our improved COVID-19 numbers, we've seen a significant decline in flus and severe colds this year. Many people are wearing masks and social distancing, and it is making a real difference but we are still far from the end of this pandemic, especially with the vaccine in short supply, millions that still need to be vaccinated and new variants in the mix. That means we have to keep doing the things we know work. I've said it, I'll say it again, practicing social distancing, washing our hands and wearing our masks. Today's action is a show of confidence and trust, but we must remain cautious. People are losing their loved ones each day. We must keep up our guard. Many of us are weary, but we cannot let the weariness win. Now is the time to put our strength and resilience to work so that we can continue to turn the corner and get through this pandemic. Also with me today is our Secretary of Public Safety, Eric Hooks, and our Director of Emergency Management, Mike Sprayberry. Monica McGee and Lee Williamson are our sign language interpreters, and behind the scenes, Jasmine and Jackie Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. We'll now take questions from the media. If you can give us your name and uh, your, who you represent, we'll take the first question. Our first question is from Katie Peralta with Axio Charlotte. Hey, Governor Cooper, this is uh, Katie Peralta Sola from Axios Charlotte. Um, I had two questions. First of all, um, would you consider where we are today as some, some kind of turning point in the pandemic? I mean, it seems that this is the most sweeping lifting of, uh, of li lifting of restrictions that we've seen thus far. Um, my second question is, are you worried about um, a, a backslide? You know, people seeing this as um, an excuse to go back to normal and kind of revert back to how things were pre-pandemic? First, we have followed the science and the data from day one, and we have seen continued improvement over the last month. All of the numbers continue to move downward and stabilize. And when you look at uh, the restrictions that we have put in place, the mandatory mask mandate, the curfew, you know that we are serious about slowing the spread of this virus. And I think that people have pulled together. Many are wearing masks and social distancing. Most businesses are complying with the executive orders. I think there's been a positive effect and people deserve a, a pat on the back. And what we said all along, that if our data indicates that we will ease these restrictions, notice that we're only lifting one restriction, and that's the uh, modified stay-at-home order and, and the curfew. And we still have these other capacity restrictions in place and safety protocol requirements because we know that this virus is still here. Of course, you're concerned about the potential to backslide, and this is why we're going to continue to emphasize the importance of wearing a mask and social distancing but also why we are continuing these restrictions in place because we know that when people gather together that there is a greater chance that the virus can be transmitted. So we think this is a positive step. Uh, we are going to continue to watch the data. Uh, if we can move some more in the future, we, we hope that that will happen as more people get vaccinated and we continue following the rules. But we're going to put health and safety of people first, and we'll do what we need to do in order to make sure that that happens. Next question, please. Our next question is from Jonah Kaplan with ABC 11. Governor, and Dr. Cohen, good afternoon. This is Jonah Kaplan from ABC 11. Uh, Governor, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to ask this question. We know businesses have been hit hard by restrictions and economic setbacks over the last year. 
does this do enough to get North Carolinians back to work and help jumpstart the economy again? Well, many business have just been hit hard by this pandemic period. A lot of people are taking themselves out of commerce and retail and restaurants and bars and hotels because they are concerned about their own safety. And we know that certain industries have found opportunity in crisis and that we've had some strong growth in jobs in many areas. But particularly the hospitality industry, the, the restaurants, bars, hotels, the travel industry, the airlines, they have been hit really hard. And state and federal government need to continue to step up and to provide help to them directly because that's an important part of North Carolina's economy. We're a great place to visit and we want that to thrive, but we still are in the middle of a pandemic. We still have a virus that is very contagious. So we have to do things to protect the health and safety of people. I do think that easing restrictions, as long as people come back carefully, uh, can help these businesses. We know that, that many of them are struggling and uh, that this won't bring them fully back. But we want to put health and safety first, and we think that this move does that. Next question, please. We have a follow-up, Jonah Kaplan, ABC 11. Governor and Dr. Cohen, on this beautiful day, gets many people thinking about summer and about summer concerts and summer festivals. If PNC Arena can open, what about Walnut Creek Amphitheater? What about Red Hat Amphitheater? And what will it take for outdoor venues to start welcoming people for concerts? So with this order, uh, Walnut Creek and Red Hat Amphitheater outdoors would be, be able to open at 30% capacity beginning Friday. They would have to take additional safety protocols, worrying about social distancing, people gathering into corridors. Uh, I think health officials feel much better about things that are outside than they do inside, and that is reflected in this order but I'll let Dr. Cohen address that issue as well. Thanks, Jonah. I think the governor hit on it. So those outdoor venues are going to be open starting Friday. Um, again, outdoor settings allow for better uh, ability to both spread out, and but we want to make sure that folks are wearing a mask. As the governor mentioned earlier, the mask mandate is not changing. So wearing a mask, staying socially distant, washing your hands, still going to be an important component. But it's great to see that we can take this step, particularly outdoor venues can be open at 30% with those safety protocols. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Colin Browder with WRAL. Good afternoon, Governor Colin Browder with WRAL. I know you reference the improving metrics when you make these decisions. How much do you base your decision on listening to people, whether it be parents or business owners or lawmakers, some of whom filed bills this week to increase capacity at sporting venues? We listen to all of those people. We've, we have listened to lawmakers and have talked to them. Uh, I've talked to families. I've talked to business owners. So many people have been hit hard by this pandemic. But the, the controlling issues are the science and the data. And I think you can see that in decisions that we have made from day one. The more the scientists and health officials learn about this virus, we try to make sure that any kind of restrictions or closings reflect what, what is being learned. So I will tell you that it's the science and the data and those improving numbers that you just saw Dr. Cohen list uh, have led us to this decision. If we were still where we were in December, you wouldn't see that from us, regardless of what other pressure would be put on by any people, or any legislators, or anybody else. We are sticking to the science and the health data and have done that from day one and going to continue to do it. Next question, please. 
We have a follow-up, Colin Browder, WREL. Governor, what message should this send to companies that have a lot of employees working remotely right now? Should they bring some of them back uh, under this order? I'll let Dr. Cohen address that specifically, but I think we still want to encourage uh, remote working as much as is possible out there. This is the dimmer switch approach. And if you can get your work done and can get it done remotely, then that's a better situation than having a lot of people in an office setting. But I'll let Dr. Cohen address that specifically. Thanks, Colin. As the governor said, yes, we would continue to encourage folks that can be working remotely to continue to do that. Remember, as we said, our, our trends are improving, but we saw that still more than 50 percent of our counties are either red or orange in terms of level of viral spread and impact on our, our hospital system. So we're certainly heading in the right direction, and that is reflected in the easing of, of these restrictions. But remember, as we ease them, we still are keeping capacity limits because we know this virus is so contagious and we know that those variants of COVID-19 are here in our state and those variants meet an even more contagious virus. So we certainly need to keep our guard up. I'd encourage all employers that can continue to keep their employees remote to do to do so um, as we continue to hopefully watch our trends um, and we'll see how we um, evolve over the next number of weeks and months. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Dawn Vaughn with the News and Observer. Hi, Dawn Vaughn with the News and Observer. I want to follow up on one of your answers about uh, workers. Are you still asking state agency employees to work remote, or are they expected to go back at a certain time? And then also you talk some about the decision-making. How much have proposals from uh, sports and bar association factored into the timing of this uh, restriction easing? Uh, well, to answer the the second question first, we, we're sticking with the science and the data, and that is what has told us to uh, do these restrictions uh, the way we, the easy restrictions the way we have. Uh, as for state employees, there are some departments we're headed by people who are independently elected, but we are still encouraging uh, remote working whenever possible. Uh, each agency head is dealing with that. There's some workers who obviously need to have to uh, come into work and those who are working on the front line, but we're encouraging as much as possible for us to protect our state employees as much as we can and remote working is still encouraged. Next question. We have a follow-up, Don Vaughn, News and Observer. Hi, thanks for the follow-up. Um, and also what you said earlier about Senate Bill 37 and having most of the schools open, that's still, you know, about 20 districts that won't be open. If you didn't like the bill that's on your desk, uh, why not just mandate that school districts open with the protocols that, that you want for Plan B? So I still think that local control is most important here, but we are strongly encouraging all school systems to begin in-person instruction if they have not. And a lot of school districts have responded to this. Uh, we're hoping that more continue to do so. But if, if the legislature wants to pass a bill mandating it in all counties, then I will sign it as long as they fix those two issues, making sure that all the schools abide by the Department of Health and Human Services health guidelines, and I would think that people would want to do that. And secondly, preserving uh, the emergency authority of state and local officials in the event that there is a problem where we need action. And I'll be glad to sign the bill if they'll send me one like that. Next question, please. Our next question is from Michael Hyland with CBS 17. Hi, this is Michael Hyland from CBS 17. Uh, during a meeting with state legislators on Tuesday, so just yesterday, Dr. Cohen, you reiterated some of the same concerns that you've had all along about the potential for the virus to spread in bars specifically. Why do you think now is the time to open bars for indoor service? 
Hi, Michael. As we went through um, earlier in the presentation, all of our trends continue to move in, a, in the right direction. Our cases are down, our percent positive has been down, our hospitalizations are down. And remember, as we ease these restrictions, it is just that, an easing of restrictions. So indoor capacity needs to be limited to 30 percent. Alcohol sales need to end at 11 p.m. Folks need to be wearing their masks anytime they're not actively eating or drinking. Um, so we think with those pr protocols in place that um, it is the right time to take this step forward. It is just a step. And again, we'll watch our trends. And if that's something that we see um, more viral spread in those areas, we'll reassess um, as we go. I hope that is not the case. I hope folks will um, really take to heart that we need to keep doing the three W's as we move forward here. Remember, there are more contagious variants of this virus here in North Carolina right now. Um, but I do think that this is the right step at this moment to be able to ease these restrictions. And again, this is because of a lot of hard work of North Carolinians um, for really a year year in trying to protect each other, slow the spread of this virus. And the other change here is we know we have two vaccines that we've been getting into arms incredibly quickly. We've administered more than two million doses. Again, that's more than a million people have gotten at least a first dose of a vaccine here. So that's really good news uh, for us in North Carolina. So we're certainly heading in the right direction. We cannot let our guard down as we do it, but I think these are the right steps forward. Thanks. Next question, please. Follow up, Michael Hyland, CBS 17. Uh, thank you. Based on what you know now with regard to the COVID-19 variants, how confident are you that you won't end up reversing these decisions today in the next several weeks? We'll continue to let the science and the data guide our decisions. And if we see that kind of uh, a variant that is causing significant problems, and we'll discuss it with health officials and scientists, and we'll do what we need to do. Uh, would you want to add to that, Dr. Cohen? Thanks. Next question. Our next question is from Brian Anderson with the Associated Press. Hi, Governor. Brian Anderson here with the Associated Press. I have one question for you and one question for Dr. Cohen, for you, uh, in exactly two weeks, you would be eligible for a vaccine on, under the provision that elected officials can get the rollout. Are you planning to get vaccinated uh, then? Uh, and for Dr. Cohen, I'm just curious if there are any plans underway right now that would vaccinate teachers on their school grounds. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to get vaccinated when my group comes up. I'm not sure exactly when that will happen, but I look forward to getting my vaccination just as other people are out there. Dr. Cohen. Hi, Brian. So, yes, starting today, our teacher and other school personnel, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, as well as our child care uh, personnel are all starting to be eligible. Um, but that means, uh, remember, that our vaccine supply is still very limited, and there are a number of ways in which teachers are being vaccinated. Some are having vaccination sites on, uh, on their uh, school grounds. Others are setting up uh, vaccine clinics at their local health department or in co coordination with another vaccine providers. Others are going to their local Walgreens to uh, get a vaccine. So there are a lot of ways in which um, our school personnel can access vaccine, but I'd remind everyone that supply is incredibly limited. And remember, we also had some shipping delays due to weather over the last week. So this week we're actually doing uh, last week's vaccination in addition to the new vaccination. So um, we know that there's a lot of work going on by our vaccine partners right now, and we appreciate all of the the hard work, um, but we know it's going to take some time in order to get all of our school personnel and then ultimately our other frontline essential workers vaccinated. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Allison Smith with Fox 8. Hey, this is Allison Smith with Fox 8. Um, just wondering, too, as we loosen these COVID restrictions, leading to spring break, are you all concerned about another surge like we saw post Thanksgiving, post Christmas? You know, we've seen this virus spread when people gather together in informal settings and in family, extended family settings. And we are always concerned when we have periods of time where that often happens. I think one of the reasons why we had such a significant peak 
uh, in at the end of December and January is because of holidays and people getting together. So yes, there will be concern, but I'll, I'll tell you this, the, the progress that we're making, the fact that more people are doing the right thing, wearing masks, the fact that, uh, as Dr. Cohen says, we've gotten over a million people uh, vaccinated, over two million vaccines have, have been given, uh, doses have been given out. Uh, continuing to make that progress, I think it will be very, very positive. So, uh, Dr. Cohen, do you want to say anything about that? Okay. Next question, please. We have a follow-up, Allison Smith, Fox 8. Um, also, with more students, I know we're trying to move to more in-person classes, but with the remote learning students being on their computer, I'm just wondering, too, if you've been following what's happened in the triad recently involving some missing girls, thankfully to have been found um, communicating with sexual predators with their abductors over school-issued computers. So what is your reaction to that happening, and is there anything more the state can do? That's deeply troubling when our children fall victim to sexual predators, whether it's online or, or in person. And I know that we have worked hard to step up our ability of law enforcement to, to go after people like that. I worked hard on that as attorney general. We continued uh, as, as governor. But it also puts responsibility. I'll tell you, our parents have had to do so much during this pandemic. Many have continued working at their job and have become teacher assistants for their own children working at home. You know, particularly younger children, making sure that they are supervised, making sure that uh, devices have some protections on them as much as possible to uh, prevent children from being uh, able to fall victim to this kind of thing. So yes, deeply concerning and troubling. Uh, we want to get our children back into school. Remote learning is a way to, to make sure that students can be safe. And we know that some students and some parents don't want their children to go back into in-person learning. So we need to make remote learning as safe and as effective as we can. But it's time to get our children back in school and we all need to work toward that. Next question, please. Our next question is from Christy O'Connor with WBTV. Hi, Governor. This is Christy O'Connor from WBTV in Charlotte. Since uh, Group 3 is now eligible, or at least a portion of Group 3 is now eligible to get the vaccine, what is the state doing to ensure that seniors eligible in Group 2 are not being skipped um, since it's likely even more competitive to try and get an appointment? So we know how critical it is to make sure that our frontline health care workers and 65 and over are vaccinated. And this is why we gave them a long runway at the beginning of the vaccination process. Uh, we know that 80 plus percent of our deaths come in that category of age 65 and over. I know that there is a concerted effort by providers to reach out to, to these kinds of people uh, our efforts to go into underserved communities, partnering with churches and community groups. So providers are still actively working to seek out uh, 65 and over, and this is why we've given all this time and gotten over half of them vaccinated. We also have more vaccine that's coming into the state most every week. We've seen an increase that has been given to us by the, the Washington Biden administration. And so we're going to continue to hopefully increase vaccine. We have the potential of Johnson & Johnson vaccine that may be coming online soon. So the more vaccine we have, the more people we will be able to get vaccinated and uh, hopefully everybody as soon as we possibly can. Next question, please. Our final question today is from Rose Hoban with NC Health News. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I have a follow-on question to, uh, you know, talking about the, it looks pretty clear that the FDA is going to approve the Johnson & Johnson vaccine this week. And yesterday at the White House, Jeff Zients said that if an uh, emergency use authorization is issued, that they anticipate allocating three to four million doses of the vaccine next week. 
So have you been given, given any indication as to a potential timeline and, you know, how many doses you'll get and how soon we'd get them? We have been talking uh, with Mr. Zients and the Biden administration regarding Johnson & Johnson, still a sp step or two for them to go through, but I'll let Dr. Cohen address that specifically. Hi, Rose. Yes, we've been talking with our federal partners, and they've indicated that there is going to be about 2 million doses that they're going to give out once Johnson & Johnson is hopefully approved for emergency youth authorization. And we've been getting about 3% of that total pot when you look at, at the other pots that they're cutting up. So we think it's about... 50 to 60,000 uh, doses that could be coming here. We're not sure. So we're planning for a range between 30,000 and 60,000 doses. Um, and we're already planning to think about where can those doses go? Um, how are we going to allocate that? How are we going to use that? Working with our vaccine providers to make sure that they, we have the capacity that's waiting in the wings. So um, the moment that those vaccines become available to us, we will hit the ground running. So um, planning is already underway. And so more to come, I'm sure, over the next number of days. Days. Um, we know that the FDA is, is meant to probably do their final analysis by the end of this week. Then the CDC advisory committee will meet over the weekend. So we hope by the beginning of next week we will have uh, more sure uh, timelines um, as well as any parameters for the use of this vaccine. Thanks. Can you take the follow -up? Oh, there's a there's a follow up, Rose. Um. Um, on a related note, you know, we, I know you've been monitoring for variants here in North Carolina. How much surveillance for the variants are you doing? Um, you know, and how, like, how much of the variant have you found in the state? Sure. Thanks for that question. We are sending a sizable number of samples to the CDC, but again, it's only a subset of the samples uh, across all of the testing that's done here in North Carolina. Um, as we identify those variants by genetic sequence, then we do report those publicly. Um, and so you can see that on the CDC dashboard that indicates what is has been found here in North Carolina. Um, and I know the CDC has recently announced um, about $200 million in a, in a larger initiative to do genetic sequencing. So we expect to participate in that effort and making sure even more samples from North Carolina will be part of that surveillance effort um, as we go forward. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Please stay safe.